Well, good afternoon, um, and, and welcome to uh, our session on uh, carbon trading, or probably should have called it carbon markets as a, a broader uh, uh, statement, uh, but I think we used the shorthand version. I'm David Pumphrey. I'm a senior fellow and deputy director for the Energy and National Security Program, and it's certainly a pleasure to have such a distinguished group here to, to talk about this, this topic. Um, when we started the debate about having a session, and um, Bill Ramsey and I were talking about doing it, and it looked like it was going to be later in the fall, I got a little worried that we might actually be behind the curve of the discussion in the, in the Senate, that things may have moved along expeditiously in the fall. But I think we can see now that we're probably well ahead of the curve on this question. Um, carbon markets are a big part of the debate that is now going on, both the cap and trade in a domestic setting, but also the creation of international markets, either through offsets or linking of current markets. And there's a lot of things that are being talked about that are based on speculation. And we thought it would be quite useful to bring in a group of people who can tell us about the experience in Europe and setting up a trading system, and then begin to um, expand that discussion into thinking about what are the issues we're going to confront as we look at moving into more global carbon markets rather than uh, regional ones. Um, in the U.S., we have begun to build carbon markets. They're on a regional basis rather than on a national basis. But this phenomenon is beginning, and I don't think the states who have started it are going to stop doing that. So we will have carbon markets in the U.S. Um, of some type. Whether they will be efficient, whether they'll do a good job of actually lowering the cost of mitigation uh, in, in climate change terms will be an important question. But with that, uh, let me first introduce uh, Bill Ramsey, uh, who is going to be the moderator for the session. Uh, Bill's um, a longtime friend uh, from many different acquaintance, uh, different uh, jobs that we both had with the State Department, where he was working uh, in the energy area and was ambassador to the Democratic Republic of the Congo, and then served as the deputy uh, executive director at the International Energy Agency, has now moved into running the energy program at IFRI. I won't try to say the French pronunciation. I'll let you do that, uh, Bill. Um, and uh, Bill's uh, very experienced in energy um, issues of, of all types. So we thought it was very um, appropriate that he should be the moderator for this panel. So Bill, if you want to uh, take over and introduce the other speakers. OK. I, uh, I don't plan to, to make any remarks at this point in time. I'll have plenty of opportunity as we go through the various speakers and then open up to the audience. Uh, I, uh, I recognize enough faces out there to know that we've got a lot of uh, intellectual uh, muscle in the audience, and so we want to get some of your thoughts about this as well. These are tough issues. We're talking in large measure about the ETS, but it's about carbon markets more broadly. It's about uh, how do you do this? How do you allocate the costs? How do you uh, share the burden? How do you do this around the world? How do you link the various centers that are developing? A lot of questions that uh, we hope we can address. Uh, I don't suspect we'll answer any of them. But I uh, would like to get into it right away because we only have two hours and uh, need, to, uh, need to get started with our speakers. The uh, first one being Barbara Buchner, who is a colleague from, uh, from IEA for many years, uh, been involved in the climate change issues and studying these, uh, these matters, trying to get IEA papers in sync with what's going on in the marketplace, playing in the game, being at the cops, and that's a noble, uh, noble duty. Anybody who's been to a cop knows that you don't want to do it again, but she's done some and will we'll be there again just shortly in Copenhagen and probably Mexico. So I'd like to turn the, uh, turn the, uh, the, the microphone immediately over to Barbara. I don't know if your slides are up yet, Barbara. You may want to come over here and look at this. Uh, we'll try to stay you know, sort of uh, under 15 minutes for each speaker and, uh, and then get to you all as quickly as we can. Uh, oh, that's it. It's one of these things. It's on. Got it. So Barbara, the floor is yours. Well, okay. Thank you very much, Bill, and thanks a lot to the organizers for inviting me here to this event. I think it's obviously a particularly interesting time for me to be here in the U.S. and I think for everyone and to follow the what's going on now uh, uh, in the context of climate policy here uh, in this country. And uh, I am particularly happy to be able to share with you some of our work on the EU ETS uh, that we've been done over the last years. And uh, this, just to mention that this work is part of a bigger, uh, of a larger project that we did in cooperation with other institutes uh, where we have done an exposed evaluation of the first phase, of the pilot phase, 
uh, of the EUTS, and this is something which will be published very soon by Cambridge University Press. And uh, in this context, I therefore would also to thank uh, the others that have contributed to that, and particularly to Danny Ellerman from MIT, who has been uh, really vital in, in, in driving this research. So what I want to do in uh, my brief 15 minutes, it's already gotten better, is to uh, verify uh, whether we found in our research some evidence for an effect of the UHS in this pilot phase, in the first three, phase, three years. So I'm trying to see whether there has been abatement, and this ob obviously is a fundamental question because the main purpose of each of any emissions trading system is to reduce emissions to some level that implies uh, emission reductions. Um, just a brief overview of the EUETS, in case you're not familiar with that. It currently covers about 40% of the EU greenhouse gas emissions. It's covering basically the power sector, the energy and tent sectors. It's going to uh, cover more of that in our third phase, which is going to start in 2013. Uh, what is an important point, I think, is that it is uh, a true multinational system. So we do have currently the 27 member states of the EU which are participating in the system, and we do have links to Norway, Iceland, and Liechtenstein. In addition, we do have links to the Kyoto Protocol and its mechanisms through the uh, certain amount of uh, credits that are allowed uh, to be used uh, from clean development mechanisms and joint implementation. Uh, we are currently in our second phase. As I said, I will talk about the pilot phase, which was a very short, uh, uh, let's say, introductory phase, which was basically really there uh, to get the system uh, uh, running and to get everything in place. And we are currently in the second phase, which is uh, coinciding with the first commitment period of the Kyoto Protocol. And we have had an agreement on the changes to the UETS directive that are going to be in place from 2013 onwards. So let me here provide some of the main overall insights that we've had in our project. And then I will focus on the last one in order to get a little bit more into detail. But first of all, I think it is uh, important to mention that we all think that this pilot phase was useful. And we all know that there have been a lot of problems and a lot of difficulties with the UHS, but still it managed to achieve, uh, to achieve its primary goal, which was to put it in place Say the trading infrastructure and to, to ensure that we're learning from our experiences in order to be able to reduce the uh, greenhouse gases in line with security commitments in this first commitment period. What we've also seen, obviously, is that now we do have a real carbon price in Europe. So we have uh, obviously problems at the moment due to the economic recession, but overall the cap is becoming more stringent, and which means that overall the carbon price is becoming more significant. And we can see that the carbon price which has emerged on the market is reflecting the balance between supply and demand. Another insight which uh, we have got a lot of uh, attention from uh, from industries that we've not been able up to now in this first phase to find any empirical evidence on an impact related to competitiveness. So we have not been able to see that there have been really like losses in market share in industries, but it may be too early for finding that because as I said before, we're just looking at the first three years and it's been a very, let's say, weak uh, target. So it has been free allocation. So this all may, may imply that in the future, this finding will change. I've already talked about that it's been a major driver of the global carbon market, so it's been giving a major uh, impetus to the CDM developments. And la lastly, and I think this is the most important of that, is that we have seen that notwithstanding the weak target and let's say the problems we've had, it has been able to, uh, to achieve some emissions abatement in these first three years. So let me just give you some, let's say, uh, issues which we think why it is important to take, talk about abatement in the first phase. And this is because emissions were significantly lower than the cap. And that has been referred to very often as overallocation, meaning that the cap has been set too high, and meaning therefore also that it's unlikely that abatement took place. But what must be taken into consideration is this, this slack condition is an exposed condition. So there was a significant CO2 price for almost two years, and therefore uh, operators which uh, were 
in the uh, facilities under the UHS actually have faced a real cost and when they had to, let's say, provide the allowances equal to their emissions. And so the question remains whether companies in these uh, two years had an incentive to respond to this price signal and therefore to, to reduce emissions. And this is important because to the extent that they did reduce emissions, uh, the, the end of the period surplus that we have seen and which has been often referred to as over allocation only was actually larger than it otherwise would have been. So give me some, uh, let me give you some background issues which are useful to be kept in mind when talking about abatement and over allocation. And first of all, it is clear that emissions will never exactly equal the cap and a constraining cap will always result in long and in short, short positions. And there's many reasons for that, and the most important one is obviously the reason that motivates uh, the trading, which are the differences in marginal cost of abatement. There's other reasons, as uncertainties of uh, weather or economic activities or fuel prices. And there is obviously uh, the main reason that has attracted a lot of attention in the UTS, which is deliberate overall underlocation. But what our point here is that uh, it is impossible to distinguish, given the allowance and emission data only, of whether it has been over allocation or abatement. Because emissions, the real extent of emission reductions depends on the counterfactual emissions, which means what the emissions would have been absent the CO2 price. And this is very difficult to do, to construct this counterfactual, and we've tried that in our study, and we are aware that there will never be complete certainty on the extent of abatement because of this constructing of a counterfactual. And therefore, we do believe that any estimate, any reasonable estimate, must be arranged. But what we've seen also is that if you do an ex post estimate, as we have done in our study, then you can remove certain factors of uncertainties uh, because you do know certain factors that have been determining emissions like economic activity, fuel prices or weather. So in a way, it helps to reduce the, uh, the uncertainties. So with this in mind, uh, we actually try to, let's say, compare the actual observed emissions with the counterfactual, so with the historic emissions which we had to build up. And our approach rests upon the belief that economic activity is the major determinant of emissions and that the relationship that we see between economic activity and emissions that we've been observing over the years before the uh, introduction of the EUTS would, con would have continued also absent the CO2 price. So we take this relationship and we project the emissions into the first uh, phase in order to get a counterfactual. Uh, this uh, exercise, which already is very difficult, has been complicated by the fact that has been complicating lots of, uh, let's say, initial uh, exercises in the UETS, which is uh, the lack of data. We do, uh, before the UETS has been introduced, there was no information on what sectors or installations would be <coughs> under the system. And so no data has been collected, and that has been one of the main difficulties in the first phase. And for this reason, our analysis relies upon proxies that if we have constructed using uh, the only available two data, data sources for historical data, which is the UNFCCC data and data that we have been able to extract from the allocation plans in the first phase. So we are aware that there is problems with this data, but it's the best that is available and we use it as a proxy for, uh, for constructing the counterfactual. Uh, let me now uh, come directly to uh, a graph that compares these projected emissions based on this past relationship with the observed emissions. Um, this is the scale of the graph has been truncated in order to emphasize the trends and uh, the annual changes. And what you can see here is on the light shading are the observed emissions in the ETS sectors, and the dark shading is the abatement that we've seen and the counterfactual in the three years that we've been constructing is actually the sum of the sector observed emissions plus the abatement. And so what you can see here is that the counterfactual uh, is continues to rise, uh, the counterfactual emissions continue to rise as they've done since more or less the year 2000. But the actually observed emissions uh, show a, a distinct flattening, and in particular in 2005, 
when the UETS was introduced, you can see that there's been a, a, a distinct reduction in emissions in these sectors. After this year's co emissions continue to increase, uh, reflecting the strong economic growth that we have uh, faced in Europe in these first years, but they're doing that on an all but uh, lower tra tra trajectory than they would have done otherwise. Uh, just to give you some numbers here, uh, what our analysis shows is that on average there probably was an, uh, an abatement of around 210 million tons in this first phase. So that's a small number, but it is something which needs to be kept in mind, particularly given the fact that uh, <coughs> usually the UETS has always been uh, monitored and portrayed as, as being ineffective and have no effect in general and has only had weaknesses, so we do believe that this is something important to keep in mind. So the basic case that we see for Bateman is that we have seen a significantly CO2 price for a large part of this first phase. We've seen rising GDP and we've seen rising output in the sectors that are covered by the UTS, and we've seen factors that we have not taken into account in our calculation, like whether or the relative prices of fossil fuels, that all worked in the direction of increasing the counterfactual emissions. So that means that our calculations are also rather on the safe side. And, uh, and, and at the end, uh, the important fact is that uh, emissions are lower than the historical emissions. So even after looking for biases and trying to look for sensitivity analysis and what we could have done wrong, we have seen that there has been some reduction in emissions and we do believe that our central value of 210 million tons over the three years is a quite uh, reasonable uh, number, but we have a range between 120 to 300 million tons. Uh, we have seen that abatement has mainly happened in the EU 15 member states, so all mainly in the Western European countries. The Eastern European countries have been allocated very often more allowances that they needed to cover their emissions. So we can see that it's been mostly on the EU15 side. We've seen that both electricity sector and industrial sectors can observe some abatement, but the main focus has been in electricity, also because the main, the dominant form of abatement has been through fuel switching, so we can see that. But what is interesting also that we've seen other forms of abatement as well, and there are a range from energy efficiency improvements, both in industrial facilities and existing power plants, to intra-fuel substitution and, and an increased use of biomass and of waste-derived uh, fuels as well. This is just one uh, emerging evidence. I'm not sure whether we have the time. Okay, that's good. So this is a, just to show you a piece of evidence where uh, several colleagues of mine have looked at the electricity sector in detail and looking really at the available data and looking what uh, has been the range between the switching between coal and gas. And he, you can see here that there is the switch band uh, where if the, uh, the allowance price is above the switch band then the utilities prefer gas. If it's below the switch band they prefer uh, coal. And we can see that the CO2 price give a clear incentive for utilities to switch from coal to gas in certain periods of the first years. Uh, what my colleagues there find is that there is abatement between 50 and 100 million tons in 2005 and 2006 in the power sector only, and this is broadly in line with the top-down estimates that I just showed you. So let me come to my conclusions on the EU ETS, where we see that we are aware that there have been a lot of problems, but I do think you have to see and you have to judge the EU ETS also in the context of the very short time period when it has been launched, and also in the context of many problems, particularly data problems that we have faced. And uh, we do think that the pilot phase was successful. It has provided important lessons also for other countries and regions that are currently trying to design emissions trading systems. We do have the infrastructure in place, and most importantly, uh, the carbon price has induced some emissions abatement. So uh, the carbon price is, uh, has managed that companies do respond to the price signal and they start looking for ways to reduce emissions. And we do believe that this, uh, this effect is an extremely important one. It is true that the abatement was modest over the first years, but you also have to keep in mind that the ambition of the pilot phase 
was very modest. It was really something just to get the system started and just to get everything in place. So in this light, we do believe that this is quite a big, uh, big insight. I showed you that the exact magnitude is always something difficult <laughs> to identify. So uh, we do have poor data. We have obviously difficulties of, of creating this counterfactual. Uh, but we believe it's important just to make this point that whenever you see a long position and, and surplus on the market, on a carbon trading market, it does not in se imply that there has been over occasion. But you have to look very much at the details in order to identify uh, and distinguish between abatement, uh, the primary goal of such a system, and over location. So let me make a step back now and uh, pull the findings uh, that we have on the EU emissions trading system in a little bit broader context. And this is something we have developed at the IEA and which we do, uh, let's say, propose as a two-tiered approach to greenhouse gas mitigation, where we say that on one hand, we do need market instruments, which are really essential to transmit this CO2 price signal. And we've seen that in the case of the UETS, uh, and we've seen that also in the case of other trading systems or market-based systems that are being uh, in place uh, around the world and that are being currently discussed in Copen uh, for the Copenhagen negotiations. But what we've also seen that uh, trading is not enough. Uh, there are problems because the price signal is not always effectively transmitted to the end, end user, let's say to the consumer, because there's market barriers, in particular in areas like energy efficiency, and so we believe that there is other targeted policy interventions that are needed in order to reduce emissions in certain areas. We also think that whatever kind of policy package or climate policy is uh, being designed in domestic context and in international context, you always need to keep in, in, in mind what are the practical implications of these policies. Because you know, in the long run, uh, on the long run, what we want to have is to ensure that we have an effective uh, climate policy and to ensure that we have an effective uh, broader market in the future. So there is little details, and I know that my colleagues will talk about that, uh, that are, for example, important uh, in the context of linking. And these are all uh, things that you should keep in mind by designing these uh, climate policies. And so my last slide is just to show you why the reason for this kind of two-tiered approach uh, that we have developed at the IA. Uh, we do believe that the uh, main driver of this approach is actually cost minimization because we do believe uh, that countries have only a certain amount of money, of resources to spend on this problem. And so we think that it is necessary, absolutely necessary, to optimize the use of this money. And so we think that it is better to focus the role of the the carbon market on the more expensive areas. And this here is just a, a very simple representation of a marginal abatement cost curve, just to show you that there is areas and measures that have lower costs, like on the left side, where you usually have energy efficiency measures, which have low or no costs. And on the other side, you have the higher cost uh, mitigation measures. All on the right side, you will probably have the uh, carbon capture and storage technologies were very expensive. And so we believe that the market should focus on the more expensive technologies in order to, where, where you need a premium on uh, greenhouse gas reduction, while we think that the, the, let's say, the lower cost measures should be financed separately and where we believe they should be uh, as uh, assistance to policy implementation in countries. And with that, I'm going to finish. Thank you very much. Thank you. I think we look forward to that study coming out and, and being able to look into some of the details because there's a lot of other things going on in Europe during that time frame. There, the issue of causality and the issue of uh, shifting the dash to gas and some of these other things. It would be nice to look at that on a country by country basis to see the coincidence of uh, actual abatement and other. Our next speaker is uh, Maite Jorigui Naudin from the IFRI. She's the energy program manager, which means she does all the work and I have all the fun. Uh, she's been with, uh, with the energy program at IFRI for some four or five years now, and before that actually was here at, uh, at CSIS with the Homeland Security program, so is uh, a prodigal daughter come home to CSIS. As soon as she finds her slides on that machine, uh, the floor is hers. Thank you very much. Off you go, my team. 
Hi, uh, good afternoon everyone. Um, I'm particularly uh, moved to be in this room today because a couple of years ago I was at, uh, in the same room, but at the time I was with the uh, Homeland Security Program at CSIS, so uh, I would like to thank CSIS to give me the opportunity uh, to, uh, I mean, for its hospitality at the time, for giving me the opportunity to come back today and to discuss uh, carbon trading with you. Um, so the, the worldwide economic slowdown that uh, we, uh, we are facing today will reduce uh, global CO2 uh, emissions, but uh, uh, only uh, temporarily. Um, fear that the looming global recession is going to, uh, to delay investment in low uh, emitting technologies uh, and uh, is going to, uh, uh, to postpone the fight ag against climate change uh, are real, uh, while uh, industry uh, seek to uh, protect their industry, protect uh, employment as much as possible and uh, to avoid uh, bankruptcy. Uh, once uh, economic growth uh, will return, hopefully, uh, the need to transform our energy system uh, will, uh, will be more pressing than ever. So in this, con in this context, what can be said about uh, the tools that have been implemented uh, already and uh, are hard to be implemented? Uh, I would just uh, like to, uh, to remind that uh, it is a combination of policy instruments, taxes, sectoral approaches, uh, national measures and policy, uh, cap and trade market uh, that will be able to provide uh, uh, in, um, sufficient uh, uh, C, uh, CO2 uh, reduction. Uh, cap and trade is just one of the many tools uh, that will help us uh, with uh, the fight against uh, climate change. So to summarize the main reasons that make uh, cap and trade markets so popular for some, uh, let's just say that um, reductions are supposed to take, play, uh, to take place where they are the less uh, costly. Uh, it is up to the market forces to, to decide. Uh, cap and trade gives certainty, or like uh, Barbara explained to us, gives an, uh, an idea, in fact, of the, uh, of the goal and uh, of the reduction emission that we, uh, that we can reach, uh, but not on the price, as we will see. Uh, whereas uh, carbon tax gives certainty on the price, uh, but not on the level of reduction that we will uh, uh, obtain. Uh, also, it is already there. There are several uh, carbon markets around the world uh, today. Um, liquid, well-functioning uh, carbon market, even if they are not yet sufficient enough. So, I, uh, if I may say a word on uh, the European climate uh, policy. Uh, in 2007, the European Council decided a 20% reduction target in 2020 compared to a 1990 level. Uh, this objective implies a collective reduction of 1,113 million tonne equivalent uh, CO2. So this means that uh, the maximum level of emissions in uh, 2020 uh, should, shouldn't be bo should not be more than uh, 4,451 million tonne CO2 equivalent. This objective has been translated into uh, a target of 21% emission reduction for the sectors covered by the EU ETS and uh, an objective of 10% emission reduction for the non-EU ETS sector in comparison with 2005. If I may just say a word on the compliance of the non-EU ETS uh, sector with this objective, you may have heard that uh, France this year announced a carbon tax of 17 euros uh, the ton of uh, CO2 and uh, you, you have to understand that for France it's quite important since because of uh, its uh, energy mix only 30% uh, of uh, French uh, CO2 emissions are covered by the EU ETS. So this, um, this tax mainly targets housing and transportation. And um, as much as I think that such a tool could be uh, uh, useful uh, to, uh, to uh, induce a change of behavior um, and uh, to uh, a switch of technologies, for example, toward the low emitting technology, at least in the middle term, uh, one can wonder if the way this tax has been designed uh, right now uh, will be uh, efficient enough. First, the level is not high enough. Um, the, proposi the proposition in the beginning was to have a tax around 32 uh, uh, euros a ton of CO2. Uh, they settled for 17 uh, euros. Uh, second, for now, whole revenues will be distrib uh, distributed to a household, uh, has green checks. Uh, and uh, even if uh, the tax increases, which is not guaranteed at this point, they will keep uh, distributing the, uh, the revenues to, uh, to households. 
And um, third, French citizens uh, question the true uh, motive behind this uh, tax that might just be a way uh, to please green voters who scored really high during the last European election. Um, to come back to today's topic, the EUTS has been at the core of the, Europea of the European uh, Union climate policy. So Barbara told you that uh, uh, it covers around 40, uh, uh, a little more than 40 percent of uh, European CO2 emissions, emissions coming from the heavy industry uh, uh, sector and from the power sector. So we are currently in the second phase, who much is uh, the first commitment, uh, uh, period, the first commitment period of the Kyoto Protocol. And uh, Baba told you also that the third phase has already been designed uh, that will run from 2013 uh, to 2020, 2020 being uh, uh, the, the year uh, I mean, corresponding to the European uh, Union emission reduction targets. So, so far, what did we learn? So the EUETS UUT, is supposed to deliver a clear, undistorted and long-term carbon price signal and experience of the first year shows that uh, it is quite difficult to implement. Uh, first, a realistic cap is mandatory uh, to create scarcity uh, on the market, but also to reflect a true effort of, uh, of reduction. Uh, too many emission allowances has been distributed during the first EU, uh, the EU ETS. Uh, so Barbara pointed out that it was uh, because of lack of historic data, but it is also because state members uh, lobbied, uh, lobbied uh, in fact, the, uh, the Commission to be sure to obtain a maximum of, uh, of quota to protect their industry. And this was one of the main reasons which led to a slump in uh, carbon price at the end of 2007. Uh, second, initially, grandfathering, uh, grandfathering and free allocation seemed a good um, allocation uh, methodology. Uh, it offered simplicity and uh, an easy transition to carbon management. Uh, phase one saw that uh, com companies, may, uh, companies made uh, uh, windfall profits by passing CO2 uh, costs on consumers while selling allowances they had uh, received for free. And this was perceived as particular, particularly uh, unfair uh, when it was uh, companies who were also high, uh, high emitters. Uh, during the second phase, in the beginning of uh, 2009, companies sold uh, unused allowances, again received for free, in order to raise capital uh, because they were cash-trapped and uh, because of the impact of the uh, economic recession. So all these distortions uh, distortion, make clear the need for, um, for some level of auctioning uh, and for a trading uh, horizon that will uh, give permits an increased value over time. Uh, third, energy intensive sectors, particularly exposed internationally, will be under the pressure of uh, competitive distortions. So Barbara pointed that uh, we didn't see yet any carbon leakage, but this could happen. And in this case, in this, case this, will, this will cause um, uh, um, some um, uh, detriment to uh, the environment, uh, displacing CO2 emissions uh, in uh, uh, countries uh, less carbon efficient, but also on the economy. Uh, and lastly, I would like to say that uh, the system today is not designed to absorb unexpected events, uh, such as the crisis that we are facing today. The drop in economic demand translates uh, both in a, drop, in a drop of uh, production, but also in a drop of uh, CO2 emissions. And the cap in phase two now looks relatively uh, loose. Countries will be able to, uh, to, to bank surplus allowances, enabling them to, uh, uh, to emit, uh, to have higher emissions during uh, phase three than the cap uh, would suggest. So efforts that we are supposed to consent uh, now are postponed to later, but this is a point that we will be able to discuss maybe with the, uh, with the other panelists. Um, the EU climate and energy package that has been voted in uh, January 2000, uh, two, uh, 2008 includes a directive amending the current EU emission uh, trading scheme. In 2012, it will be extended to aviation, and then in 2013 to aluminium, uh, petrochemical, uh, petrochemical industries, and CCS. Uh, CCS development is particularly important with regard to China and India since their, traject uh, their emission trajectory will depend on the fact uh, uh, I mean, if uh, CCS is commercially available or not. Uh, so a number of improvements have, be have been made that will take effect from 2013. Among them, more than half of the quota will be uh, auctioned inst instead of uh, grandfathering. 
And so to, to, uh, to summarize all these um, uh, flaws that, that we saw, I would say that uh, I would like to stress that um, how great care, in fact, should be taken not to set in, to set in uh, stone any carbon market design uh, that cannot be uh, abandon, abandoned uh, subsequently uh, easily. Uh, it is quite difficult now for the EU to, uh, to go from a free allocation methodology to, uh, uh, to auctioning. Um, so, I mean, however, I mean, this, I, my view is that a number of flows are still up and running. Uh, the EU ETS has already fixed the cap for 2020, like uh, you saw on the first uh, slide, at a level of 21% lower than uh, in 2020 than uh, emissions in uh, 2005. And moreover, a reduction rate of 1.74% uh, has been fixed annually beyond 2020. And no review is expected before uh, 2025. But the, the quota demand depends on a number of, of factors, including uh, weather conditions, um, relative uh, commodity prices, and uh, economic growth. And they are all highly volatile factors and quite unpredictable. Uh, change in the demand will affect the will affect the uh, well, change in this factor. Sorry, will affect the demand. And usually, when you look at other commodity markets, uh, if the demand changes, supply can adjust. Uh, but it's not the case uh, in the UETS, or at least uh, not in the way that it is uh, designed. So my view would be that authorities should uh, be allowed to, uh, to review the state of the market on a periodic basis and to uh, intervene in the, on the market if they feel the need to, to do it. They could, for example, set a reserve, I mean, set a reserve price mechanism for example, for the quota to be auctioned in 2013, this will act as a kind of, uh, of a price floor, and this, uh, this reserve price uh, will, I mean, already the, the, the value of today's uh, allowances will begin to reflect uh, that greater value since uh, investors will have a, a better view of the upcoming uh, uh, period. Uh, moreover, my, my feeling is that price flows and, and eventually selling uh, can reduce price volatility. So it is true that banking and borrowing can, uh, of permits can temper uh, the market's fluctuation through longer term uh, uh, price expectations, but the ability for the UETS, for example, in 2009 to sell uh, free allocations uh, on the market demonstrates demonstrate that it, it wasn't enough to, uh, to, uh, to avoid a drop in, uh, in price. All this being said, despite EU uh, ETS falls, uh, the EU succeeded in setting a constraint on the price on CO2 emissions. Uh, Barbara showed you some, uh, some good results that I was happy to, uh, to, to constate. To constate. Um, and uh, I guess, I mean, with all the adjustments that we, uh, we can make, uh, the, 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 the needed reduction could be delivered uh, accordingly. Uh, the EU ETS is uh, today the, the largest market, uh, the largest carbon market by far, and it is a driver for other markets, uh, and especially the CDM market. Uh, there were also other policy objectives uh, uh, than, um, behind the EU ETS. There was, of, of course, the objective of uh, reducing the emission. But uh, the EU wants also to set an example uh, in showing that industrialized uh, countries are on a downward uh, trajectory. And uh, finally, the EU wants to, um, to encourage developing countries to participate in the carbon markets. Uh, so far, industrialized countries failed to persuade uh, uh, developing countries, and in particular uh, the, uh, the emerging economies, that their uh, development could, could go, I mean, could progress in the same way as uh, the fight against uh, climate change. Uh, if uh, we have a look at uh, IEA projections, uh, you can understand from this slide that um, most of uh, future CO2 emissions will come from non-OECD uh, uh, countries. I mean, even if uh, all the industrialized countries decided to, uh, uh, to flat, uh, I mean, to, to reduce to nothing their, uh, their CO2 emissions, it wouldn't be enough to, uh, to, uh, to fight against the climate change. Um, so the latest WEO, that I didn't have the time to process um, uh, entirely, states that uh, emissions uh, peaking in 2020 will require investment needs in non-OECD countries of 200 billion US dollars in 2020. 
Industrial nations at this point won't be able to afford direct, uh, direct transfers to third countries in light of rising debts and large budget shortfalls worsened by the economic recession. So we can only count uh, on a well-framed carbon market to uh, channel important uh, amount of money towards this, uh, uh, these countries. Uh, so far, the clean development meca uh, mechanisms that you, you might know under the CDM uh, name remain the only instruments for integrating uh, the developing country and the uh, emerging markets into emissions trading. So its defaults are well known. First, it is a project mechanism that avoids emissions but uh, doesn't impact emission reduction directly. Second, it didn't impact the energy mix of host countries. Yep. <laughs> fast. <laughs> then, <laughs> the most important uh, CDM partners are China, India and Brazil. There are just a few projects developed in uh, Africa. Uh, transaction costs are very high at the detriment of uh, small projects. And there is also the question of, uh, of additionality. Uh, host countries having little incentive, in fact, to develop uh, policy measures like um, energy efficiency measures, for example, uh, that could lead to, uh, to a loss of some CDM uh, projects that wouldn't be eligible anymore. So obviously the CDM would, uh, would have to be uh, uh, scaled up. Um, and uh, International climate policy uh, could, for example, um, consider a, a sector, I mean, to extend the CDM mechanism uh, to, uh, to, sec to sector, for example, uh, with regards to a predefined uh, baseline uh, uh, like uh, carbon intensity or, or uh, energy intensity. Uh, sectoral approaches will allow better diffusion of uh, technologies already available in realized countries and uh, we can hope that they will prompt faster global emission reduction. And this will also reduce competition distortion between, uh, uh, for industry exposed uh, internationally. Uh, so to conclude, because I can hear Bill behind me, I would like to stress that carbon markets are not commodity markets like, uh, like others. First, because the primary objective is not to obtain the, the best price, but to uh, uh, but abatement of, uh, of CO2 emissions. And second, because we, uh, we mustn't forget that um, uh, in other markets, supply can adjust to the demand. Uh, these markets are, in a way, artificial markets. Uh, one primary objective could be uh, summer rights to uh, control the earth's he temperature. And because uh, they are artificial markets, they depend more than others of uh, good regulation that will condition their efficiency. I thank you very much and I'm looking forward to your question. Thanks, Maite. Well, there you, there you have a couple of policymakers' perspectives on how this all might come together and uh, the design flaws and how we might do it uh, in the future. But it reminds me a little of the conversations that Ed Chow and I have, or Ambassador Gray, about governments talking about pipelines. It's interesting for governments to talk about things, but it's the private sector that has to do it. Ultimately, who's going to trade those, uh, those permits? And so we've asked Shell to join us to bring that uh, private sector perspective. Uh, Graham Martin, as you can see by his bio, is involved in these things in North America, and uh, I would ask him, once he finds his slides, to, uh, to take the floor. Okay, wonderful. Well, uh, thank you very much, and uh, thank you very much for having me here. It's a real pleasure to uh, give Shell's perspectives on carbon trading, and uh, more specifically on the EU ETS. I would ordinarily ask you to read uh, this slide. As you can see, my lawyers have been at the slide pack. Um, but if you just rely on the fact that you can't rely on anything I'm about to say, we'll, uh, <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll carry on. So just, just to set the scene a little bit, uh, I work for a company called Shell Energy North America. We're a part of the Shell Trading Network. I'm based in Houston, so I cover a lot of the environmental markets in Canada and the US. But I work very closely with my colleagues in London who have been very instrumental in the EU ETS from its, uh, from its very early days. Uh, doing many of the first transactions in the clean development mechanism. So I'm really uh, I'm here on their behalf to give our thoughts. So what I thought I would do is run through some uh, key design criteria that we think are important in the design of any emissions trading program. And then we can go through each of these uh, slide by slide and, and, and I'll give a bit of commentary as to how we think the EU has done it. Um, but I think these will be more generally useful in thinking about how might a, a, a cap and trade program look in the US and hopefully in, in North America. 
So we've got things like a, a long-term environmental objective, uh, establishing scarcity, uh, a move to auctioning. Uh, the, the system should treat CO2 just like any other commodity, which is uh, contrary to what we've just heard. Um, uh, recognizing key abatement and uh, technologies, uh, linking to offsets to really in, in broaden the scope of the program, and finally building on something on a sound infrastructure base. So those are, I'm sure there are others. Those are our thoughts, and we'll, we'll go through them slide by slide. So if you think about the long-term objective in the EU, as you can see here, you've got phase one, phase two, and then uh, what we think phase three is going to look like. There is still some uncertainty exactly how aggressive the EU is going to move in phase three. Um, but but what, you, what we've tried to show here is that if you look at it from you know, going back five years and going out, uh, going out to 2020, there's a fairly predictable gradient, and that's helping companies like ourselves have some confidence that there is uh, teeth behind the regulation, that there's a real um, motivation from a policy perspective to, to continue with these kind of programs. So these, these kinds of um, long-term price signals are important. Obviously with Waxman Markey and the Senate bills, they're looking at emission reduction targets out to 2050, which really does help set the, uh, set the long-term objective, which for a company like ourselves, when we look at emission reduction projects, these projects have 30-year lives. And so it's very important to have that long-term objective. So we've already heard a little bit about establishing scarcity. Obviously, to do that, you need a cap. You need a cap to be um, below emission levels for, for um, allowances to have any sort of value. And I have a slide at the end which, which shows what happened when, when that wasn't the case in phase one. Uh, and, and so you really do need a lot of good data. And I think we're, we're going through that process in the US right now. Um, I think that there was probably a, a lack of good data in the EU, but, but a lot of those issues have been overcome. I and mean, the EU is, is an interesting one because it's not, it's not like the uh, federal program in the US where uh, something is just uh, done at the federal level. The EU obviously is, is a collection of different countries. That EU objective has to be devolved onto, onto each inv individual country. And so every country then has to make sure that it's, it's, um, it's uh, assigning the right amount of um, allowances to, to industry to ensure that the overall target is met. And um, there are obviously some, still some adjustments going on, uh, and, and, and I guess you might, you might call it tinkering with the, with the program. But on the whole, I think, uh, as, as we've learned from phase one, the EU's done a pretty good job of ensuring some scarcity in phase two and beyond. The issue of auctioning or allocations is probably one of the most contentious issues in uh, the US right now. And, um, the, the way we look at it in Shell is, is really to think about how the price of CO2 is going to be embedded throughout the, the, the economy as a whole. And uh, you know, when, when you start off on a program, typically what you find is that uh, CO2 price is, is affects the, the, the company that holds the obligation, the, the regulated company. But over time, as that, as that price finds its way throughout the value chain, then it really does spread throughout, and, 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 and throughout the economy to the consumer. And the idea is that in the long term, if you're auctioning these allowances, which is really the only sustainable way to do it, that auction revenue is recycled back to the consumer through, through the tax system. But it takes time for that to, for us to get there. And uh, I think it would be a mistake to just auction 100% allowances off, off the bat because there's a lot of trade exposed industries. There's, a, there's a, an uneven playing field. But for some industries, and I think uh, the power sector in Europe was an example of this, where you had free allocation off the bat, um, that, that there was this, this potential for windfall profits that auctioning um, may, have, may have avoided. So treating carbon like uh, any other commodity, I, I'd agree that the supply is, is relatively fixed. If you, if you do have a, a cap on allowances and a fixed number of offsets that you're allowed to use, uh, I'd agree that they are created by regulation, and so they're, 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 it's not necessarily something like oil where, where the market is created because people need it. But at the end of the day, if you're going to, if you're going to set up a market and you, you're going to tell companies like ourselves to, um, to, to, to uh, be involved in that market, then we, we do have exposure to prices. And the best way, in our opinion, to, to manage that exposure is to allow as much, of, as much normal market behavior as possible to occur. So that means avoiding price caps, price floors. That, all that really does is, is prevent carbon from, from getting to its true level and to encourage things like liquidity. Uh, so respect to property rights once given, uh, allow banking. Don't restrict trading to just um, 
companies with compliance needs because whenever we go out in the market to hedge, the chances of us finding somebody with an equal and opposite need is, is, is very remote. So you need somebody on the opposite side of the transaction, you might call them speculators, um, to, to be there. They, they, they perform a very valuable function. And finally, um, you know, allowing all sorts of, uh, all, all forms of trading. Exchange-based trading is very important, but a lot of transactions do occur in the over-the-counter markets or bilaterally. And so there isn't a one-size-fits-all approach. And I think from this perspective, the, the EU has actually done a fantastic job, and uh, you, you'll see, uh, you'll see the, um, how that's manifested itself on my last slide. So number five, recognizing new technologies. Uh, Shell believes that carbon capture and sequestration is uh, going to be critical. It's one of the few technologies that can really deliver significant emission abatement um, uh, projects. And at the moment, uh, CCS is not recognized in the CDM. And so um, th there's some work to be done there. We're working very hard with, with folks over in the EU to, to try and achieve that. Um, and we hope that that, that, will, uh, that that won't be the case when we have a US program. If you think about offsets and, uh, and linkages, uh, I think the EU has done a good job of linking to uh, other you know, emission reduction opportunities in other countries through the clean development mechanism. And as we get more, I'll just bring all of these up here, as we get more uh, countries on board, um, it's important that they all link together. The wider the pool of abatement opportunities, the lower the cost of, of abatement. And, and so you need that linkage and compatibility between programs uh, to, to, um, uh, to encourage uh, global investment in emission reduction projects. And I think uh, Shell's going to touch more on uh, LinkedIn in, in the next presentation, so I, I won't spend too much time on that. Finally, uh, foundation infrastructure. Um, it, it's important that we're all speaking the same language. It's important that uh, the infrastructure is in place. And from this perspective, I think, as a, you know, as a practical matter, the EU didn't do such a great job. A lot of the registries weren't set up at the beginning of the program. Uh, there was a number of years where there was no link, no uh, registry link between emission reductions generated through the clean development mechanism and companies' own accounts on their, on their country registries. So if you'd invested, uh, you know, in some cases, millions of dollars in projects in China or India, and you're relying on those credits being used um, in, for, for your compliance in Europe, that, that there were some um, nervous months when we, we all wondered whether uh, all the registries would get linked up in time. Um, thankfully, a lot of that has now been, uh, uh, has now been rectified. Um, but something to bear in mind when you're looking at the US program is that it's, it's important to get a lot of that nuts and bolts uh, out of the way before the system comes into place. So if you look at what, what's been going on in the EU, um, one of the things I hear commonly is that, that the EU failed in phase one because the price went to zero. Uh, and you know, carbon, was, carbon was worthless and, um, and why did we even bother? And as you can see from the gold or yellow-ish line here, that represents uh, the price of EUAs to be delivered in December 2007, so it represents the, the phase one price. And you can see that it you know, reached a high of over 30 euros in, in um, so April, May 2006, and eventually traded at, at cents on the dollar. Um, and the, and you know, the simple reason for this is twofold. One, that there were more allowances in phase one than, than emissions. But critically, phase one allowances weren't allowed to be banked into phase two. And I think if you had that banking, you wouldn't have seen that, that precipitous price drop. Um, but at the end of the day, you could also make the argument that, well, it, it was a trial period, it was a test run, so do you necessarily want a large bank of allowances moving over into when the program started for real in, in 2008? But from this perspective, you know, the, the, so, so the cap part of cap and trade maybe was set a little bit too high, but the trade part actually was, was uh, functioning very well. If you look uh, in, I guess this is the middle of Q2, when prices dropped from 30 odd euros to 13 euros, uh, look at the, the blue bars down at the bottom of the, of the chart, you can see a real peak, and that's, that's traded volume. And what would have been very dangerous is if during this period of new information coming to light, everybody in the marketplace had just kind of shut up and not really done anything. That would have been a, that would have been a, a, a signal of a market failure. But in fact, you actually had record volumes trading. And so although there was a, a big move in the price, the actual underlying market was functioning reasonably well. The other point I wanted to make about this is, um, well, a couple of obvious ones. Obviously, volumes have grown um, 
uh, almost exponentially, I guess, uh, uh, um, over the next couple of years. If you look towards the end of 2008 and 2009, you can see in the, in the, the bold line that's going to drop in from, again, 30 euros down to about 10 euros uh, over Q3 and Q4 of 2008. This is the, the, the price of a, a phase two allowance, effectively. And, and of course, this was a time when the economy was, uh, was really suffering. And so again, many people say, well, that's a reflection. You know, that, that's, that just shows that the market isn't really working. It's not doing what it was supposed to do. Uh, I think uh, our response would be, well, actually, that's, that's exactly what it's supposed to do. So as economic uh, productivity declines and emission rates fall, then this is exactly the kind of time when companies need a, need a bit of a break on, on, on their costs. And a market does exactly that. You don't need as much emission reduction to meet your goal for that particular phase. And so the price comes down somewhat automatically. So I think this, um, you know, overall, uh, I wouldn't have said the EU is, a, um, is uh, a flawless system. But in terms of creating a very robust market where companies can rely on the carbon price signal and factor that into their own internal policies, I think the EU, EU has, has done very well indeed. So that really is it. Uh, I'll just uh, draw your attention to um, uh, the website down there. Our chief climate change advisor, Mr. David Hone, does a lot of blogging on topical issues uh, around policy. Uh, so hopefully you might find that very interesting. But look forward to questions later. Thank you. On the circuit as a former Norwegian energy advisor and uh, years in the Norwegian government doing a lot of work in, in uh, transmission work, electricity systems, uh, 10 years as the vice chairman and board of directors as the, of the Norwegian transmission system operator. So in terms of integrating uh, low carbon energies into uh, the real world, uh, he's got some uh, real experiences. But let me turn the floor over to you. Yeah. Thank you very much and, and, um, and thank you uh, CSIS and David for inviting Point Carbon and me to speak. Um, I've been invited to give you about 10 minutes of introduction to linking markets. Um, as you may know, uh, the uh, European Commission has been very vocal or at least very explicit in terms of their um, ambitions to link up the European program with a future U.S. Uh, cap and trade program. Um, uh, moving to the U.S., um, there hasn't been a lot of public uh, discussion about these issues. Uh, uh, but in the current bills, uh, there are provisions that would allow such linking with uh, programs of, of comparable stringency. So, so the, the scene is set for, for this kind of linking to take place. What I'd like to do is just to, uh, show you with a few, very few slides, four or five slides, some about the theory, theory of linking and something about you know, how that can be applied to a linkage between a U.S. program and a European program and maybe then identify some some issues that actually could have political implications and could pop up in the way when we get into the more, you know, implementation phase of this. Um, so for the purpose of time, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on uh, presenting my company. We, you know, most of our business is at the global level in Europe. We have 30 people in Washington, D.C. trying to serve an emerging U.S. market. Uh, let's go to linking basics. So assume we have to uh, separated carbon markets, A and B, and we create a, a joint common market between them. So what's going to happen? Well, immediately you're going to see trade flows between the two market components. So there will be allowances, allowances of permits going each way and the money will flow the opposite directions. And what does that mean in terms of uh, effects? Well, you'll get eventually or ultimately a price equalization uh, in this uh, combined market, and you get some advantages uh, from a market efficiency point of view in terms of you get lower price volatility, more liquidity in the market, you get less vulnerability to market manipulation, and so on. Uh, the important thing is that if you look at these two markets collectively, they will be able to reduce their total compliance cost when they do this together than when they do it separately. Uh, so that's a very important uh, takeaway. It's maybe not so easy to monetize, you know, politically, but in a global context, uh, it's very important because it would will allow us to set more ambitious greenhouse gas reductions targets in the long run. So assume we have a situation whereby th where there is we have two markets, and one of the markets 
uh, either have higher cost of abatement or more stringent targets, ambitious targets, and the other one has uh, low cost of abatement or less stringent targets. And you try and link these markets, what happens? Well, obviously you're going to see that permits are going to move one way. Uh, and you're going to see capital moving the other way. And, and what does that mean for, uh, for Region A? Well, it will mean a higher price for carbon. It will mean a higher cost of compliance for the emitters. But the price is you get more investments, you get an inflow of capital, you get more domestic reductions than you would otherwise get, and you get some advantages in terms of jobs, new technology, maybe better improved energy security, and so on. On the other side, what will they get? Well, they, their advantage is the lower carbon prices, lower cost of compliance, but they have to pay for it. They get fewer reductions than they would otherwise get. What's in it for both? Well, total abatement cost is likely to be lower, and there is a more efficient market that normally translates into a lower carbon cost overall. Uh, so let's put this into uh, practice and look at what would happen if we try to link up a uh, European program with a North American program. And I say North American because I assume or I predict that you will have a joint U.S.-Canadian market. Uh, and we link these markets. Now the situation is more or less like the A and B. Um, we are likely to see a uh, significantly higher carbon cost in Europe because uh, simply the phase three of the EU ETS, which starts from 2013, is going to be relatively stringent. We're coming out of recession, so we're going to see relatively high carbon prices in Europe. Um, depending on the target that Europe will be setting, I mean, it's either 20 or somewhere between 20 and 30, you can see at least prices you know, ranging from $35 and up. Um, and then when you look at the U.S., when you look at the bills that have been proposed, and we look at our models, and you look at the EPA models, you're going to see prices maybe in the same time frame of half of that, maybe 10 to $20 per ton, maybe a little bit more, but at basically there is a significant difference. So, Europe will buy permits, big time, and money will flow to the U.S. But the interesting thing here is that if you look at North America, the size of North American market is about or at least three times that of the EU ETS. So the interesting effect is it doesn't look that bad because in the US you will get a somewhat higher price for carbon. In Europe you get a significantly lower price for carbon. So is this a political problem? Um, we'll see. So what will this mean? Well, U.S. emitters will face a higher cost of compliance. There is extreme attention to cost in the U.S. discussions, political discussions about cap and trade. Will this increase be significant enough to become a political problem? Well, we have to look at the other side of the equation because there is something we get. So we get investments. We get inflow of capital. We get more domestic reduction. Actually, we get more project in the US. We get more economic stimulus, more green jobs, more technology, more clean energy, improved energy security, possibly. The other side, Europe is going to get fewer domestic reductions. Well, Europe has been talking about creating more reductions domestically. So is this a problem for Europe? Um, anyway, um, then, um, to stay within my 10 minutes, we'll just have to make this a little bit more complicated. So <laughs> we have uh, not only flows between Europe and the in North America of permits, but we have this concept of offsets that also will play into this. So if we then assume that uh, the Uni United States will be relatively generous and say that in order to contain our costs, we have to import offsets from uh, CDM or any other crediting mechanism at the global level. Current bills suggest 500 million tons per year, increasing up to 750 if we can't find enough domestic offsets, which you will not be able to. So we're talking 
you know, big numbers. Um, and then, what about um, Europe? Well, um, uh, Europe has been very active in terms of using uh, global offsets. Um, and I, j I just have to, 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 to slip in a comment to, to Barbara because I do think it's very interesting to, to, to use the magnifying glass to find the reductions in Europe. Uh, but after all, the main result of the EU ETS has been generating a project pipeline of 10,000 reduction projects globally. I mean, the EU ETS has been the main driver of a pipeline that will generate not 200 million tons of reductions, but 1.6 billion tons of reductions by 2012. It has leveraged about $100 billion worth of clean energy, clean tech investments. So I know that your project was focused on the Europe, but I just wanted to supplement you and, <laughs> and mention the, the very important, that was the point with the EU, EU system. We want to use offsets. We need to contain our costs as well, so we will allow imports of credits. So that what ha happened was just intended. But Europe is moving towards less dependence on, on offsets. So they've said that, you know, in phase three, we're going to use less, we're going to prioritize the least developed countries, maybe Africa. So they will scale down their use of offsets. So basically, what does this mean? Well, the, a significant use of global offsets in the US will keep prices down at the low level. Low use of offsets in Europe will mean that European prices will be higher. So what does this mean? Well, Europe will be even more interested in buying permits from the US because they're good. And uh, this is quite interesting because then in a way what happens is that it's the European program that will generate demand for and the high price of global offsets and US, United States demand for global offsets. So in a way it's a kind of the EU importing low global carbon prices and it's effectively a swap in a way. Uh, and this is all assuming that there are no quantitative restrictions on these flows. Now, let's look at another issue finally. And this is the issue of forestry and ag offsets. Now, in the United States there is a lot of interest and a lot of uh, expectation in terms of how many reduction can be generated by the forestry and the agricultural sector. Generally an open attitude towards inviting those offsets into the program, domestic as well as international. So if, if this happens, you will see some significant flows of red offsets, of domestic offsets, and then what will happen? What we know is that Europe has been very skeptical these instruments for different reasons. So they're kind of careful in touching the, the, the forestry side. So even if they don't, what will happen? Well, it's the same thing. So we have actually then a low carbon price in the US caused by using all these biosequestration offsets. Generate an interest in Europe to buy more permits from the US. So, um, what, what you can, this is again a kind of a swapping. It's a kind of a greenwashing of offsets that Europe doesn't want, but it shows that these partial linkings or indirect linkings with offsets, uh, they, this does not prevent uh, prices and market forces to penetrate all the markets. So you get some price penetration and policy leakage. And all these, just, I don't have the solutions, but I do think that some of these issues are potentially politically contentious and that they need to and will be addressed when we get to that point. So those were my observations. Thank you. Well, it's always a pleasure for a moderator to have the last speaker provoke the audience. Uh, and I suspect from what I'm hearing muttering on my left, it may have provoked a few of the panelists as well. So what I'd like to do is to give an opportunity to the panelists to comment anything that they may have heard that they would like to comment on from other panelists. Just let's take a couple of minutes for that. And then I'd like to open the, the floor to the audience. So does the panel have any observations on uh, other panelists' comments? Madam? 
please. Okay. Thank you very much. Well, I do have a lot of observations, but let me start with uh, the first one, which was directed to me. I, I think I, I showed in my presentation that we have had several findings in our project, and one of the findings is exactly that the UETS has been a main driver of the global market, and we do consider that as an important thing. There will be a chapter in the book, so maybe it could be good to read that in the book before we <laughs> look at uh, everything else. But I think this is something which is broadly known. So I think for me important, here for me it was really important to to look at the side of the abatement because this is something which has not attracted a lot of attention. And this is something which is not well known. And as I said, it might be a, a small number, but it's still something important because it shows that emissions trading systems can set incentives to change behavior and to make the carbon price, uh, let's say, be reflected in investment decisions. And so I think this is something important, and this is why I, I try to focus on, on this point. And uh, another point I just want well, I had some comments on, on meters. Uh, presentations, but I, I, I have to admit that I've fully subscribed to what Graham said in, in his presentation. I do think it's really important to create a long-term signal and, and any climate policy instrument and every climate policy architecture should be able to, to provide this long-term certainty in order to give investors a, a certainty to, to do their investment decisions. So I think it's important to maximize the confidence in the system and to, to I think sometimes that too much, it's already an artificially created market, so too much regulatory interference with the system and with the market, I think uh, could undermine the market. And, and I think I agree that you should let the market work and you should try to not interfere too much and also to, to not uh, undermine also the confidence from the investors and the, and the entities under the system from the beginning. So <coughs> that's my comment. Okay, and it's unfortunate the, the table is as short as it is because uh, obviously from this discussion we need to have an Indian and a Chinese uh, official at the table to talk a little bit about their attitude about offsets and how much they're going to allow Europe to mine offsets in the rest of the world or how much they would like to have Europe carry its own burden. If you look at the, uh, look at the evolution over time of European energy policies, the energy intensity is dropping quite, uh, in, uh, quite dramatically over the last years. Uh, but if you look at the carbon intensity, of the society. It's not dropping anywhere near as quickly. And if you break down the, uh, the achievements of the Europeans in, in meeting their Kyoto target, the EU 15, uh, and look at that uh, eight or seven or eight percent reduction, about half of that is in nitrous oxide and methane. It's not in carbon dioxide at all. And the carbon dioxide is more in terms of structural readjustment from the five, from the five lender and a dash to gas in the UK. So how much really effective reduced carbon emissions have we achieved in some of, the, uh, some of these countries? Let's, uh, let's see what the audience has to say. Any questions from here, please? Right here. The gentleman with the glasses, yeah. Um,